Um, we're excited to kick off uh, the second day of the BizTalk Integration Summit 2013. Um, I wanted to start off by saying thank you once again um, for being here. I think it's been a super high energy event and um, we're really excited about all of the interaction that's been occurring between the sessions. Um, it's really terrific seeing all of the networking that's going on and seeing all of the sharing. Um, but this is day two, it's Friday, um, so we're in the closing. If you have come here uh, because you had questions, because you wanted to meet people, because you wanted to network and you haven't met the people you were hoping to see yet, um, let me know or let the event team know and let's put you in touch. Um, it's really important that we make this a successful event for you um, and anything we can do to help um, is a step in the right direction. So in the presentation that we're gonna start off with today, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Mark Mortimore and I'm really excited to be here um, with you and, and I think we've got a great year ahead. We've heard a lot about the opportunities um, for improvement in this space and we're really looking to drive hard um, to make that happen. <clears throat> So today we're gonna to have a quick welcome. I'm gonna cover some of the housekeeping um, in that. I'm gonna focus a little bit on One Microsoft and how we're driving forward with our integration platform. I'm gonna have uh, then Hector come up and talk um, a little bit about um, the vertical industry solutions and then Stock Creations is gonna be jumping up on stage to talk about the solution that they've developed um, in the healthcare industry and how that, that's um, uh, building that foundation uh, for customer value. And then we move on uh, with a preview of our day and some of the activities that we've got going on through the day. So welcome to day two. Um, we've got an exciting agenda and lineup for you. I wanna give you a couple just uh, reminders about logistics and I'll, I'll re-remind you at the end of the presentation as well. So um, we do, uh, we are recording um, the presentations in this room um, yesterday and today and I'll be posting those videos online within uh, I'll say a week or so. Um, for you to be able to um, review and for you to be able to point your colleagues to that were unable to be here with us in person. Um, also the presentations uh, will post and make available. So I've had several inquiries from, from you about, you know, are the presentations gonna be made available? And yeah, we are gonna make those available um, as well. Um, that's great material for you to be able to use and um, you know, we'll, we'll look to refine those as we move forward. Oh, the other thing is um, we're upstairs um, in this room, so there's gonna be continued sessions um, in here throughout the rest of the day. And then we also have a, another set of sessions that's occurring, so we have a second track that's going on. And the room that that's occurring in is the room that you had breakfast in this morning, just downstairs. So as you're moving between rooms, if you are in one session um, and you think, wow, you know, maybe this other session would be more interesting. It's just down the stairs. If you're down there and you think the session up here, come on up. So you can um, move yourself around as appropriate um, and we've uh, got everything set up. Scott talked a little bit yesterday about Microsoft innovation and some of the things we're doing across the company. Um, and while there's a lot of interesting information on this slide, what I really wanted to focus on is um, the third box on the bottom um, as just one example of what's happening in GFS right now. Um, and it's really revolutionizing um, the experience um, in the cloud. So one really interesting thing is, is GFS, our, our team inside of Microsoft um, that delivers our data center experiences, manages a, a suite of properties. Um, so one of those properties is Microsoft.com um, and it's one of the um, uh, most hit websites in, uh, in you know, uh, uh, 
out there. So another is Hotmail. Um, that small service drives through GFS. Um, another on that screen is Skype, um, who's now um, driving 33% of the worldwide uh, telecommunications traffic. Um, with uh, 50 billion Skype to Skype minutes per day. Um, and that's running in the GFS data centers. There are about 200 properties running in the GFS data centers and Azure is benefiting from all of that experience and capability. So that's, that's an exciting space um, and, an, and an exciting thing to think about. Um, that this experience that we've built in these data centers is really revolutionizing the, the way that um, we're delivering data uh, throughout the world. And um, the explosive growth in Windows Azure um, that's occurring right now um, continues to be um, an increase in trial activations. Um, if we were able to look into some of the activity that's occurring there, we would probably see a lot of Hello World apps um, that are coming in right after the trial activation uh, where people are trying uh, out in the cloud and seeing how that, that works for them. But what we're seeing in terms of the explosive growth um, is the onboarding of real business applications into the Azure cloud. As companies are starting to think about this, um, they're looking at how do I think about actually driving my business applications into the cloud and how can I start making that happen? And a lot of people are starting with dev and test as one of the key scenarios and that's, that's something that uh, a lot of businesses are looking at where the IT department can take an anonymized database but that has the same schema structure as the production databases but without the PII that would be of a concern uh, you know, for that uh, industry. Also, they're able to take an Active Directory infrastructure that mirrors their Active Directory infrastructure and bring that up into the cloud but without any of the uh, perhaps real customer, you know, real internal uh, employee information um, that would have been in the real Active Directory, but with the same schema structure so that they can control dev and test in the cloud um, and uh, be confident about the information that's up there. Um, so IT pros um, tend to be creating these workspaces for the developers and then arming them with a PowerShell script to be able to hydrate that entire environment, that multi-machine environment, and then when done with the development experience for the day, be able to um, take that environment back down in a few minutes um, so that there's the most efficient um, you know, economy there as possible. So we're really excited about how Microsoft is bringing things together for us um, and how um, some of these capabilities are um, really exploding um, across the company and benefiting uh, other groups. And certainly in the integration space, um, we're being carried along um, by a lot of these tremendous capabilities. And as we move forward, we'll see integration technologies carrying these technologies forward with real business apps in the cloud. So that was kind of an all up Microsoft view, but Eric this afternoon kind of giving you a preview of what we're gonna be covering for the rest of the day in these solution focused, solution showcase day, that's really what the theme of, of this day is about, is um, Eric is gonna be talking today about what Microsoft is doing in the integration space. With 30 million incoming messages per month, um, 3,400 integration streams that are centrally managed with 70 on-premise BizTalk servers, only 70, year-on-year um, -year increase um, of 30% in the integration area with 600 trading partners, 200 internal Microsoft systems, um, and driving all of these capabilities and workloads. This is a tremendous story, and Eric's going to be coming up here along with all of uh, several of our our key partners in this area, and they're gonna share with you how they're delivering great customer-facing solutions on the Microsoft integration platform and sharing with you some of the lessons they've learned along the way um, and some of the recommendations for success for you um, in building solutions. So one of the topics um, that we've covered a lot here is the importance of the partner ecosystem um, to the integration business for Microsoft. Um, we have 
uh, tremendous uh, relationship with our partners um, in this space. And really partners are part of that uh, symbiotic connective uh, tissue that drives between the technologies that we're developing um, and the solutions that customers are, are looking to implement. And, and partners can really help um, our customers in this space. And so we're really working to shore this up. Um, Wednesday night, um, both uh, my management team as well as uh, some of the leaders from the enterprise partner group came here and met with a small group of uh, passionate partners in this space to talk about what we could do to improve uh, the linkage between opportunities that are brought to us um, from our customers and uh, bringing together the partners that can help implement successfully or accelerate those opportunities. And so Marcia sh shared with me uh, uh, a view of, of what she's looking at um, this calendar year. So driving the Azure revenue and Azure consumption, and part of this also has to do with, you know, in the family of Azure right now um, is also the BizTalk family, the on-premise, um, so this is a little inside Microsoft, but the on-premise remedy for BizTalk server is also attributed to the Azure team. So these folks are driving that revenue and consumption, and so they can um, understand the importance of the on-premise um, requirements that you have today and the hybrid requirements you have um, today and moving forward. And their activity is really around three um, important areas. They want to make sure that they're recruiting the best partners and identifying those partners. And I'll show you how that's being done in one specific geo um, to make that connection really tight and make sure that you're getting a full Microsoft experience and, and enabling um, all the great capabilities that our field can provide. And activating um, that partner capability and making sure that we've got the right connections and that people are engaged and brought in at the right times to ultimately improve the customer experience because that's really what it's all about. So one of my mentors had a kind of a driving saying for me and, and it kind of drives everything that I do. That if what I'm thinking about is right for Microsoft, if it's right for our customers and it's right for our partners, then we should push on that because that's going to be the right thing to drive. And so that balance of, um, of symbiotic value is really what we're looking to drive. So here's what um, one of the things that Marcia Green has built um, is this global distribution of business development managers. And again, um, you probably see some names here you're familiar with in your area, and we'll have these slides available for you to be able to make contact. So if you're in these regions and um, you're looking for how do I get connected um, into opportunities that are coming out and how, I, how do I as a customer find the right partners, um, these are folks that can help. And the way that they're helping is they're actually building these um, partner portfolios and saying, you know, for these critical business areas, who are the go-to partners that I've vetted and can trust and engage partners around? And so what Marcia said out of the meeting on Wednesday is that we'll be building a specific heat map uh, for integration so that the business development managers have a clear view of who to bring in in this depth area so that uh, we can be successful in uh, making the right connections as we're moving customers and, and uh, uh, into um, the integration space or forward um, into hybrid and cloud solutions. On the one Microsoft view, the one other thing that I'd like to say is that we have a tremendous amount of assets, not just here in Redmond, but all around the world. So here in Redmond, we have the Executive Briefing Center, but around the world, we have our Microsoft Technology Centers. And these are places that are open to partners and customers to be able to come and drive proof of concepts and briefings um, and really move the needle on, um, on our integration platform. Steve Fox and team drive the Global Center of Excellence for MCS, which is also available to help augment these efforts. We're really thrilled about um, those teams' depth in this area. Um, a lot of the folks have, uh, like, many of you partners in the room, a decade of experience on our integration platform and are keen to 
share that experience and, and uh, value um, in the process of um, onboarding. They're also developing um, assessments, guidance, um, and really driving a lot of the um, thought leadership around modern apps and, and, uh, and providing guidance around what needs to be implemented to drive global scale. So yesterday we talked about how Windows Azure drives a full complement of application services, data services, and infrastructure services that help customers answer the question, how do I integrate my enterprise and business partners? And that one integration stack um, is really something that we're um, looking to drive forward moving, uh, moving ahead. So not just uh, BizTalk on-premise, Service Bus, um, Active Direct, but also including Active Directory, um, app API management and mobile services as part of this um, integration platform. So this one view, I think, is really elevating the discussion, and um, it's been a great week this week to get feedback from you on where you're at as customers and where you as partners are seeing customers in this continuum and how we can get things moving forward um, in the right way um, so that we have the appropriate um, solutions for our, our customers um, that need these solutions. So with that, I wanna turn things over um, to Hector Rodriguez, one of the real important areas um, as Hector's taking the stage that I think is really relevant here um, is that these in, uh, integration solutions um, largely come into reality as they're driven into a specific vertical. And the knowledge of that vertical um, becomes really key in implementing a solution that will lead to customer value. And Hector, um, thank you very much for coming today, is um, I invited Hector um, because a lot of the folks who are here in the room who are customers um, come from the healthcare industry. And so it made sense for us to have Hector here, not just representing healthcare, but also representing all of the verticals um, across Microsoft. And, and really what, I'm, uh, what Hector is gonna share with us today is how one Microsoft driven into the verticals with the support of our partners is delivering fantastic integration solutions um, that are really moving the needle. So thank you so much, Hector. Uh, and um, we'll Thanks, come back Mark. at the end. Thanks, Mark. And good morning, everyone. We'll start, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we've been doing in industry and why industry solutions matter. We'll then have the example from Stock Creations and what they're doing with an enterprise service bus in healthcare. So again, my name is Hector Rodriguez. I'm our national director of our healthcare industry team. I've been at Microsoft going on 10 years now. Um, I've worked in this industry for a long time. I have worked across multiple industries, but I've been in healthcare for about 18 to 20 years now. Um, uh, way too long, probably. <laughs> the, uh, and a couple of things that I, I wanna say, uh, about four or five years ago, uh, we were here at Redmond, and, and we do this, th this conference called Tech Ready, and we're talking to Steve Ballmer in a Q&A, and, and, and I asked him, uh, as part of the Q&A, what's Microsoft's role in industry? And he said something that really, really stuck out, and I hope that everybody at Microsoft heard this, was every one of our customers is in an industry, and that's why industry matters. I also got a Zoom that day, so it was really special for me. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, but that's exactly the point here as we go through this. Think of yourselves, what industry are you in? What solution are you trying to sell? What does your customer or you as a customer have to hear? Because at the end of the day, it isn't that it's Azure underneath, it isn't that it's BizTalk, it's what outcomes are you driving? Why do you do what you do? Not, what, uh, not, it, not only what you do. So we're gonna talk a bit about the why. We'll talk a little bit about the what because Microsoft does a lot of what. We are a technology company, but we with our partners and, and our customers, I mean, there are a number of people here that I see that I've worked with, we put solutions together and that's what people have to see. They have to see those solutions. So we'll talk a little bit about what we've been doing with the Modern Data Center. And, and really, when I look at Microsoft's Modern Data Center off offerings, when it comes together, we talk about an intelligent infrastructure. And I love that Alan uh, Scott spoke yesterday about their experience at HCA. Uh, Alan and I actually go back uh, a ways. 
we worked together um, at an integration company uh, called Cbeon before that, so uh, we've worked on a number of projects. And HCA is probably the biggest integration project I've seen in a long time. But what Alan did was he created an intelligent infrastructure, and he didn't use that terminology yesterday, but if you listen to the components, the ability to test, the ability to scale, the ability to monitor, and, and even have an environment that heals and scales and, and is dynamically evolving, that's an intelligent infrastructure. And, and at Microsoft, we don't always talk about that as an integrated component. We have individual com conversations about BizTalk or Azure, but the reality is it's an integrated conversation. It's an integrated solution platform. It's an intelligent infrastructure. And that's what industries need in order to remove IT as a blocker and go back to, again, something else that Alan said. IT is a business service, and it's a business enabler, and it's how we are going to move beyond today's world of computing and the things we do into, into the modern world, into the future. And, and I use healthcare as an example. As we go through transformation in healthcare, what we need in healthcare and what the uh, Institute for Health Improvement calls um, the new world of healthcare. We need new designs, but in order to create those new designs, in order to innovate, we need an intelligent infrastructure. And we need it to be able to allow us to do all these things. So I'm not going to read the slides, but we need it to be agile. We need it to, uh, to respond very quickly, to enable our productivity teams. Now, to embrace devices, social networking, to bring in exactly what the world is doing today. And, and the other thing that we really need, this is a big focus area for Microsoft, and I want to bring this up because I don't think we talk enough about it, is we need to be able to manage security, privacy, and governance. We need, and, and compliance. Compliance is a huge issue nowadays. And I was just reading an article on cybersecurity. That has to be built into your infrastructure. It has to be always on. And, and we just don't see enough of that. And at Microsoft, my role has been to really be the instigator, be the troublemaker with the product teams to make sure that they're looking at those uh, types of things. And in this intelligent infrastructure that we can enable now across not just Azure, but uh, System Center, the on-prem security and, and the ability to comply with security requirements is at the core of everything we do. So it's built in and it's not an afterthought. The, so a couple of things, and, and these are rhetorical questions. You don't have to answer them. I know. Um, the, so you got to think of what are we all doing right now? What is Devin doing right now on his machine? <laughs> We're creating and consuming data. Yeah, I'll pick on people. I'll ask them random questions. I'll put you in the spot. <laughs> um, we're all creating and consuming data, but you've got to think about where is it going? What's happening? Is it integrated? Is anybody learning anything from this? What are our, the people who want to do business with us, the people you want to do business with, are they getting any of this? Are they learning from this? Is it an optimized experience? What we really should be talking about here all the time is the experience. We are all consumers. We are all healthcare consumers. We are participants in different markets. And what really matters is the experience. What experience are we having and are, are those industries enabling us to have? I was, uh, went to breakfast yesterday with one of the, um, actually someone who used to be a Microsoft partner, now, now works for an airline industry. And he was telling me that their airline, what they're trying to do now is really learn who we are as travelers before we even book the trip, before we get on the plane, but while on the plane, and then afterwards, they want to be part of our experience, and they want to extend our experience beyond that passenger seat. And that ties for every industry. We, we, we'll talk about what we call the patient journey. What hospitals want to do is they want to be part of your experience when you're not in the hospital, beyond the four clinical walls. Retailers want to do the same thing. Manufacturers want to do the same thing. They want to know more about you when you're not in the car. They want to know more about you, you know, retailers, when you're at home, not just when you're in, in the store or online buying. So that's what we talk about when we say, is the experience optimized so that these organizations know more about you? And the last thing you have to ask yourself is, who cares? You know, why do they care? Um, so let's look at that. And I, and I start a, a lot of conversations is start with why. Why do they care? So you look at an airline, the airline conversation. They want to provide a better travel experience. But at the end of the day, they want to sell me more stuff, right? They, they want me to take more trips with them. 
They actually, I was talking to this airline yesterday, they want me to buy movies on the plane, they want me to rent uh, equipment, or they want me to rent devices or even watch these things on my own devices, but they want me to pay for this. And the airline industry has actually done a great job with this. Uh, I know we all complain about it, but the airline industry is suddenly profitable and, and cutting costs at the same time, but providing more services, yeah, that we all pay for, but it is a profitable business now, which, uh, and most of them, which haven't been for a long time, uh, when we look at hospitals, and, and again, I, I've been in healthcare a long time, but what we've seen, hospitals reducing uh, hospital-borne infections and, and really uh, reducing the number of deaths from those infections, eliminating readmissions. These are all things that cost hospitals a lot of money. And in today's world, the federal government, the Medicare, Medicaid, and, and others are not going to reimburse hospitals for these types of incidents if it was caused by the hospital. So they've got to focus on this. They've got to reduce these capabilities. And the only way they're going to do this is by gathering more data, by being integrated into everything we do so that they can avoid what are really called avoidable events. Um, yesterday, we heard it. Fisheries don't want their fish to die. Now, the guy said the, it's, it's very uh, imperative when fish start to die. Guess what? more imperative than that? Very urgent. He said when fish die, it gets urgent. Hospitals. Someone told me at a hospital once, I asked, we're, we're doing an architecture design um, for, for the HL7 interfaces, for the clinical interfaces, and I stopped the design session and said, what happens when your interfaces go down? And one guy in the group said, our patients start to die. That's pretty urgent when you start to lose people, when you start to lose your patients. And so that, a bit of, a, of an analogy there, but, but things start to die. They start to go severely wrong. And that can be avoided with an intelligent infrastructure with good integration and good data across that whole ecosystem. Again, beyond those, those walls of the structures that we're all so used to. And the other thing with financial services, I actually started my, uh, I started my career at Bell Labs, but in, in, um, it was, I'm old, so it was during when, uh, when Bell Research Labs was breaking up. So we all went to work on Wall Street. So I started, uh, I had a, a number of years in financial services. And one of the things I always remembered about financial services was how quickly they adopted technology and how quickly they integrated. So using uh, the swift messaging or in, in New York City, um, the, the different banking uh, connectivity and, and, the, and actually they were cloud services at the time because we connected to uh, shared services to integrate all these banks. But why were they doing it? Why do financial services do that so well? Because their product is money and the fastest they do it, they remove friction. They make more money. They, wanna, they also, they wanna sell us more stuff but they also need to reduce fraud uh, they need to make sure that their consumers stay with them and don't move very quickly. It's really easy to open a bank account on the web today, but they don't want you to do that. They want to keep you. So that's why this type of integration, and this, that's their why. They want to provide you with better services, a better experience, but they also want you to spend more, more time with them, spore, spend more on their, on their credit cards and so on. So let's talk a little bit about the opportunity here. Let's look at a couple of industry statistics. And this is really, really key. And I will tell, um, I mean, all the partners, I know the customers know this. When you walk into these organizations, the conversation is not really about BizTalk or System Center. It's not about Azure. It's about why does the customer do what they do? When we look at this, and, and we look at it as partners in Microsoft, we, we have to say our customers want to attract more customers. They, they need to drive new revenue streams. You talk about health care, any health plan, uh, with the new laws, a health plan today cannot rely on industry, on, on health care premiums, so, so the insurance premiums to make their money. They must spend that money by law on proper health care. So that means they've got to look for other lines of revenue. Just like any other business, they must start to do that. And the other thing is, we have to drive less defects across every industry. I worked on a, on a really large integration project at Toyota years ago, and one of the things that, that we learned was they, um, Toyota is really well known for their lean manufacturing processes, but the waste in those processes was pretty high. And, and so what we were doing was gathering the data further upstream to make sure that demand signals were telling them exactly where waste was gonna occur, and they were able to reduce their waste from about, I mean, we found anywhere to between 10 and 20% to two or 3%, which is more of what uh, are acceptable standards across most industries. 
So let's look at some of these, and, and just to make you think of it, you look at articles today, we as Americans toss out 40% of all the food we buy. That's a lot of food that we toss out, a lot of waste. So there's a lot of work going on in that industry to integrate supply chains and value chains, to integrate uh, logistics, also to integrate us at home, our appliances, to learn more about us, to be able to predict what we're going to do with the thing with the food we purchase and why because they want to reduce uh, food waste but it also leads to other things and I know um, you know more more things uh, alleviating hunger but increasing the use of resources uh, reducing cost and if organizations are able to do for the, uh, this for you if you're a retailer and you're able to engage your customers in this type of experience those customers are going to keep coming back people are going to want to do more of that with you when you look at, um, at the pharmaceuticals uh, industry, and I, I, we, we had a, a session with CVS, and, and it was amazing the statistics that CVS has about how we misuse prescription drugs and the amount of waste in, in healthcare system. There's a lot of waste. About, it's a $3 trillion a year system. About $900 billion of those dollars are wasted. They are just, I mean, that's, that's huge. It's, it's almost 30% of those dollars are wasted. But if you look at just prescription drugs alone, 60% of, of all of the drugs that are prescribed to Americans are wasted. That means they're not taken, they're taken incorrectly, they have interactions with other drugs. And, and again, that's a lot of money. It means people aren't getting better. But, but look at what, what happens. People die, there's adverse reactions, people end up in the hospital. Those are all avoidable events if you had the proper data, the proper integration uh, to medication adherence programs and, and to other information uh, capabilities that can help you solve that problem. And the last one, and this one I think just affects every uh, industry. This was interesting just looking it up. Industry uh, inventory shrinkage. Everybody has uh, inventory of some way, shape, or form. And, and you've got uh, defects, you've just got waste. Uh, but in, for retailers, it costs over $31 billion a year in losses. And guess who pays for that? We do. We do. As consumers, we still pay for that. And, and so it causes revenue loss. It causes unsatisfied customers, price increases, uh, and so on. It's, it's, it, it's just a, a problem that affects everyone. I mean, I'm, you, you go into any store, you ask for something, and they don't have it. The first, you, you walk out. You're not going to buy something else. Um, so it's, it's, again, avoidable problems with more data and more knowledge that you would have insight to. And the last one here is what I was talking about. In lean manufacturing uh, environment, the waste of inventory is one of the seven major wastes. And, and, what, and, and it's interesting when you read up on lean manufacturing what happens when inventory is wasted or missing. But the big one that really st uh, uh, stands out for me, and you see this, is it stops a production line. If you don't have the parts that you need in time, and they're not there on an assembly line, it stops production. And that just means everything stops, especially when it's an upstream part. So you think about an automobile manufacturer or someone who is making, uh, well, anything, any, any type of appliance. If that main piece is missing or those, those main screws are missing, it stops the production line. So we talked a, little, a lot about why, and now we go into some of the how and the what. But one of the things that I, I do point out, and these are some research papers uh, from different researchers. Microsoft works with a lot of analysts. Uh, Gartner is, is here today. They're one of the ones that, that we always point out. Their points of view also in cloud. But one of the things that always sticks out for me and why I always say to healthcare customers, they ask me, why would I care about the cloud? And the first thing I say is, just look at it. The economies of scale are amazing. And the latest research by Nucleus, uh, Nucleus Research says the cloud ORI is 1.7 times, so almost two times faster than doing this on-prem. Um, so that's one of the reasons, just right off the bat, why we should be looking at this. Uh, you look at other things, and this is going to bug some of the partners, but they also say, well, you can reduce your consulting time by about 40%. They're not saying that redu they re you reduce your focus on solving your business problems. What you're reducing 
is having to build infrastructure, having to invest in data centers, because that's not something every organization should do. Now, I walk into a lot of hospital IT centers and health plan centers, and they're all doing the same thing, and they're all trying to get out of that data center. So the cloud provides them with that capability to immediately get into a data center where they can start focusing on solving business issues, not infrastructure issues. So we've got the, you know, the, the usual things, 25% less support, but increasing benefits over time. Again, it's, the cloud needs to be looked at just because of this economic uh, advantage right away. Now, one of the things that Gardner said, I was, I was doing a, um, a, a presentation about a year, a couple of years ago, and, and as I was writing this out, one of the things that I concluded from all the questions I was being asked is, that we were already in a hybrid world. And I had written something in the presentation that I thought we were gonna be in a hybrid world in healthcare for at least the next five to 10 years, or probably throughout the rest of my career. And, and Gartner came out with a piece last year where they said, we are always gonna be in a hybrid cloud. We're already there, and we are always gonna be in a hybrid cloud. And I really, truly believe that. I see that every day. We're, we all use cloud services today. Um, most of us know that, some, some don't, but the cloud is growing every day. You've seen the statistics uh, from Mark and from Scott and some of the other presenters, but it's out there. It's already happening. And so you've got to start to think as a customer or a partner, how do I enable this hybrid world? And you've got to start to really look at where those opportunities occur. So this value chain, it's a healthcare value chain. I'm a healthcare guy, so I'm going to use all my examples from healthcare, is a value chain uh, that was put together at Boston Analytics. What I love about this, and I'm an integration guy, my uh, career was spent writing middleware actually, and, and trying to solve what occurs at all of these lines. That's where these entities touch, that's where friction occurs, and friction is cost, but it's also an opportunity to automate those interactions. But the other thing that you see in this diagram is it's very point to point. So there's no, there's no enterprise service bus, there's, there's no middleware here. But when you look at where all of these organizations touch and where the data occurs, as Boston Analytics says, that's where you have the opportunity to improve by gathering that data and using it in your analysis. I, I, and I, I love the way that, that, they, that they just simplified this presentation. I use this every time I speak, and it's just amazing how the audience, when you're talking to a chief medical officer or a transformation officer, uh, a CMIO, uh, at, an orga at a healthcare organization, this is what they focus on suddenly. They're like, yeah, we've never looked at the value chain and what's occurring at all those touch points because they've been so focused on their four walls. So when you look at that healthcare provider, when you talk to a hospital, that's where they're so used to operating and they've got to go beyond that now. So the, what I did is, as part of this diagram is I got rid of the lines. And, and I introduced the hybrid, and then when we start to talk to our ESB partners, we realize what we're really talking about here is service enabling, using an intelligent infrastructure approach, all of these organizations. So again, Alan talked a little bit about it. I know, Courtney, you're going to mention this too. Instead of creating all of these partner connections, trading partner connections, because they don't go away, now you start to create services. And those services open up the channels to your different trading partners. So when we look at, um, I'm just going to paint this out. When we look at Microsoft's uh, cloud OS uh, vision and, and, and in health, again, I've, I've changed some of the wording on this because it is a hybrid platform. Microsoft calls it a one consistent platform. In, in our vertical, we call it one consistent hybrid platform. Everything is not going to move to the cloud. Healthcare organizations are still relatively terrified of the cloud, just as uh, our... Uh, a number of other people. But the industry has done, has taken tremendous steps to sort of allay those fears, well, to, to really do that, by partnering with Health and Human Services or the, the Center for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services to really understand what governance, risk, and compliance looks like in the cloud. And there are cloud consortiums uh, across multiple industries that are doing just that to enable um, people like Microsoft, people like our partners, our customers, to build those patterns to, to really embrace that hybrid cloud. 
One of the things that um, really sticks out on this slide, and we haven't spoken enough about, I know it's, it's a biz talk conference, but it's System Center. So I just a quick question, who uses System Center in here? Which, and who uses it to manage biz talk? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty powerful tool, and in its current version, in the 2012 or 2012 R2, it's, it is the way that you manage the hybrid cloud. We've been getting a lot, a lot of attention for what System Center is able to do now in the, both the private and the pub, uh, public cloud space, so in that hybrid cloud. And it's one of the things I always ask every customer and every partner, how are you using System Center to manage what you do? It is, um, I was at, uh, speaking at Trizetto's conference in May, and, and one of the things, um, after the presentation, their CIO came up to me and she said, it is the one product, that, the, the most undersold product at Microsoft that has the most potential to make a difference in this industry. And, and I was so glad to hear that from her because I, I believe that and I see it growing, but I, 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 I make a, um, a real stand for, for taking a look at System Center and realizing that it is the way to manage that environment, to provide more visibility of what's going on in an environment, and again, to drive that intelligent infrastructure. So when we take a closer look at the, some of these components, I know I'm gonna, I gotta give Courtney more time. The, what we've gotta move is from that current data center where everybody's buying their own storage, doing, doing their own thing, into that hybrid data center. So more of these, more of these shared services. Again, I'll go through this quickly, Courtney. I want to give you more time. The, we, talked, we spoke about security, privacy, and compliance, but the controls that are built in, take advantage of those. Don't recreate those. That, that's a, um, become a real big differentiator from Microsoft in the cloud. The capabilities that we've built into our uh, cloud services to provide uh, transparency and control, but accountability, auditing. I mean, they don't get me started on auditing, but the cost of auditing for a healthcare organization or any organization, if you get audited by the SEC or by one of the government regulatory firms, uh, it's really, really expensive. So if you can prove to them using your intelligent infrastructure that you operationalized your audit controls, it is a huge uh, time saver and, and cost saver. So. The, you know, as we talked about this, what we're really talking about here is the experience. And again, I, I, I'll be the first one to say, Microsoft doesn't talk about this integrated enough. We have a device conversation. You'll go to any Microsoft event and we'll have someone talking about devices and how, you know, how cool the, the latest Surface RT is or, or the new Dell uh, Pro 8. They're great machines, they all are, and, and even our competitors. But you have to talk about the experience. And the experience is, the combination of those devices with the apps, with the data, with the security, it's what the intelligent infrastructure facilitates. It facilitates that experience. And, and with that, we'll go into, um, into Courtney's conversation. And, I, and guys, be nice to her. I know you're not used to seeing females up on the stage, right? We were joking about that. She, she, was, she let me say that joke, so I am being politically correct. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. So I, I want to introduce Courtney, and I know we will have a little bit of interaction, but yeah, you're next. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thanks, guys. I know we have probably, what, about 15 minutes left, so I'll try and be brief. And uh, just wanted to spend a little bit of time sharing with you who Stock Creations is. So we're passionate about healthcare and building SOA environments and implementing the enterprise service bus in healthcare specifically. I've, I've personally been in healthcare for not as long as Hector, um, seven years, and um, I have been in the trenches and have experienced the challenges that come about through poor integration or lack thereof. So it's exciting to be here today with a close-knit group who get it and who want to make a difference in healthcare and integration. So, so a couple of questions before we get started. Does anyone know where the World Health Organization places United States healthcare system? Ranked? 37th, yeah, very good. Um, what about cost? Where do they rank there? Number one, yeah, yeah. I don't think those numbers have changed too much since 2000 when they did it. Um, but I did find an interesting report um, online yesterday uh, that Bloomberg put out in, uh, the, in August, and they were talking about efficiency. 
And so where do you think the U.S. ranks in efficiency in healthcare? I'm sorry? <laughs> yeah, so, do you know? Anyone take a guess? Feels like out of 200 countries. 47, so between Serbia and Iran. So pretty fascinating, right? <laughs> so, and um, who do you think was at the top of that? Just out of curiosity. Anyone know who's number one efficient healthcare system in the world? She's giving out Zunes. <laughs> <laughs> Hong Kong, Hong Kong has got it, followed by Singapore, so. All right, and I wanted uh, Hector to take a moment and share the dimensions of the patient journey. So this ties it back to what we're talking about here in the experience, and I'll tell you, when you walk into an organization and you talk about their consumer's journey, so again, I said it earlier, we're all healthcare consumer journeys, but look at this diagram, look at what's happened here in this uh, work being done by this organization. They've listed the dimensions of the patient journey, and it's not just the hospital, it's everything else that is happening around it. I, I love this work that, that was started um, by this organization. This is how I start all of my presentations when I talk uh, to a healthcare company or organization, and they focus on this. Why? They want our data, and they want to get to be part of our lifestyles when we're not in the hospital. That is where this world is going. So we are on a journey from the day we were born we are, we are part of a record, and I, you know, I was having conversations with the partner of Visionware who's here about what does that mean. It means that that index, that person index, that people, places, and person index, that is foundational to what we are doing now, to what organizations are doing to create and collect that, that data. Um, but also, we as healthcare consumers, we want to consume that data wherever we are, on any device, at any place, at any time, because it's important to us. It actually makes a difference in the way that we spend our healthcare dollars and live, live our lives. And I believe that that is true across uh, all industries. The more information we have, the better we're going to be. So that's the question is, what can make the journey better? Well, first of all, put the patient in the middle. Put the consumer in the middle, because we are the healthcare record. This is about us as, as healthcare consumers. It's not about the provider or the health plan, even though I know traditionally they believe it has been, but it is about that healthcare, that health plan member, that hospital patient or that wellness program uh, participant. But what we need to do, and if you look at this diagram, again, this is a, a diagram from an organization called Skylight, which I think they nailed it. Those connections, those lines, that's the ESB. That's the real-time ESB. And the people who are on the periphery there are the ones providing the services. So when you think about what does the biz talk conversation or system center conversation, intelligent infrastructure conversation start to look like, well, it's what's supporting all of this and those capabilities for happening. Great. Thanks, Hector. And so when we think about the patient journey, Whoa. we have to consider appliances and devices, if you will, for patients and providers. So what are they using to get their data? And where are they pulling it from? So you think about these. I've got this wonderful slide. And don't forget about the cloud. You, you want to consider what is the best way to integrate and set up communications between devices and applications? And how does the patient fit into the conversation? So that's what we want to challenge you with today, is how does a patient uh, fit into it, and what is the impact on that patient? And how do we create a flexible and efficient environment within that communication between applications and devices? So this is a typical healthcare IT architecture that we see when we go into an organization today. Uh, it's static hard-coded custom development, lots of custom development. And it, pre it presents a lot of challenges when you consider change. So what does it take to add an application? What does it take to change or upgrade an existing application in this environment? So you want to start thinking about services, as Hector mentioned earlier, and bringing services into the conversation and using services as a way to communicate with applications across your enterprise. And so you can see there we have different versions of services, which allows you more flexibility than you had in the previous environment. You can start plugging and playing services, um, changing out applications without risking the entire enterprise. There's the cloud. 
<laughs> and so bringing it all together, let's talk about the enterprise service bus. Who's using the enterprise service bus today in healthcare? Okay, we got a couple. Just general, yeah. Yeah, okay, excellent. Do you guys think you're using it correctly? <laughs> That's one thing we think about. <laughs> so, so anyway, the enterprise service bus, does, what is the main benefit of the enterprise service bus? We've got six minutes, 30 seconds left. Can, can anyone share that use it? What is the main benefit that they've gained out of it? Okay, I kind of get that. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that Alan uh, Stott said yesterday is that I want to take uh, 500 partners and uh, create five of them. Take it, or it was 800 to five. And I thought about that and I go, is he talking about the ESB and creating generic workflows and having five ways that 800 partners can move through the system or communicate through the system? So that's what I thought about was the enterprise service bus because that's what it does is it creates generic workflows and it allows you to free up development time um, and do things more efficiently across your enterprise. And of course, we don't want to think about, we want to continue to think about SCOM and how that's part of the conversation and how important that is um, as you think about creating a holistic architecture for your patients. And really, this slide here, I love this slide. Um, <laughs> this slide was created out of a conversation that we had with Hector a couple of weeks ago and his passion for keeping the patient centric to the conversation. So as you do your good work out there, think about how does it impact the patient, um, you and your families. So anything to add to that? No, I think I, I like the way that you guys brought this together, and, and, and this is exactly what we're talking about. Being in any industry, and again, we're, we're using the patient uh, flow, the patient journey here, but again, it is about exactly what he said as his answer. Not only am I extracting away those services so that I don't have to know about all of them and creating these efficient channels, but I'm able to gather analytics at the point of, of occurrence, I'm able to gather them very quickly and I can get data in a more real time or near real time fashion to that person that matters the most, that consumer at the top, that health healthcare patient, health plan member or retail consumer because that's who needs it to make decisions. But it could also be the doctor or the nurse who's providing care uh, and needing to make decisions in more real time about what to do at that at that point in time. And, and so while the, the ESB and System Center, the intelligent infrastructure, is facilitating all of these interactions, what we're really talking about here, again, is that, that experience. Yep. Thank so. you. And we did it, Mark. We kept you on schedule. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's funny notes up here, like uh, <laughs> reminding us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, I really everyone. appreciate that. Thanks, Hector. Thanks, Courtney. Sure. I, um, in closing on the, the focus, um, we've come through a lot of inter introductions, we've come through a, a lot of conversations. Um, I'm really excited about where we are uh, as a community, as an integration community, working on these solutions together. I'm, I'm thrilled with the energy that I've seen in the room over the last couple of days, and I'm really excited about the journey we're all on together um, over the course of the next uh, year, as well as kind of into the future, um, moving forward these solutions and continuing to develop and hone. Uh, these capabilities. We've announced some exciting things this week. The availability of uh, BizTalk Server um, 2013 Developer Edition. Um, we released earlier this year BizTalk Server across the board, host integration server. Um, really telegraphing that, you know, forward-looking commitment to these products and uh, the, the capabilities that they enable, um, both on-premise and in the cloud. With Service Bus releasing and Windows Azure Service Bus, or Windows Azure BizTalk services um, going into general availability, uh, we're just moving one step, uh, one step, and one step, and one step closer uh, towards our goals. And then the road ahead, 
Um, we see that future of on-premise and hybrid um, it, as an accelerator for us moving forward. Um, and we're really excited to see the cloud integration with Windows, Azure, BizTalk services and Service Bus as a growing opportunity um, <coughs> for our partners and for our customers. <coughs> One of the analogies that I have for this is a, a rocket. Um, we've built a tremendous foundation together over the last 15 years in the integration space, and I wanna say thank you for that. Um, this group in this room has been largely uh, responsible for that, and it's, it's fantastic um, to see you um, together still um, focusing on these technologies and these solutions. Um, and we've also built a rocket on top of that launch pad, which is our, our on-road into the cloud. And, you know, tying yourself to a rocket on a faulty launch pad um, is a disastrous uh, kind of outcome. Um, but that's not the situation that we have. We've built a really solid foundation um, and a really uh, tremendous opportunity um, to move forward and accelerate. So on with the day, I have uh, a couple of um, announcements to make. Um, on the EDI session this afternoon, um, on your schedules, um, we had uh, that set up with a single presenter, but we're actually splitting that time today. Um, and one of the teams inside of Microsoft that built a, a really amazing solution, um, we were able to get them here and get them uh, willing and, and able to um, share that time in the presentation today. So that session at one o'clock on EDI um, is gonna cover not only EDI from the product group perspective, but also our internal pilot implementation for Xbox supply chain. And I think many of you have seen in the news, Xbox uh, has now gone uh, into retail um, as of midnight last night. Um, so this is an especially relevant um, solution. Um, from a time, timeliness manner, but it's just an incredible solution to take a look at, and the team um, really did an amazing job decomposing the architectures, the challenges that they addressed in the solution and moving forward. And also, <clears throat> as you've seen on your calendars, Eric is gonna be presenting, talking about the Microsoft solution for this, and that really is a huge scale solution um, that um, I think will be very interesting to see how uh, Eric and the team are managing that kind of scale, um, leveraging our integration technologies. <clears throat> Couple pieces of quick housekeeping. Um, I wanted to say thank you again to everyone who traveled here to be with us. The Microsoft folks that are here, our partners, our customers, um, it's been fantastic interacting with you. Thank you so much for being here. I also wanted to say thank you to Ali, Amy, and Shauna, our event team for really pulling together a fantastic event and dealing with a thousand logistics that none of us even realized were being addressed, um, but led to this great experience today. And they've done a really tremendous job in this and it's been uh, a huge relief for me to have their assistance and, and, um, and uh, uh, efforts um, leading to such a great outcome. I mentioned before, we're gonna be posting the decks and videos, so that'll be available for you. Um, the evaluations are on your table. It's really important that you share with us your perspectives on the event today. Um, if you want us to come back next year and have another summit, um, that would be a good comment to put in there. Um, if you uh, think that another set of events um, is really important, um, if you see features in the product that you uh, are looking for, if you see uh, collateral that you think needs to be developed, if you see continuity and connection in the field that you think would improve our experience together and our success. Um, these are the kinds of um, comments that we're really looking for. And last, I'd like to say, um, I'm really excited to be part of this area. I've met a lot of people uh, this week face to face that I've been talking with on the phone for some time now. So this is great um, to see us together. Um, I, I wanna offer to be an assistance um, to folks. So if you're looking for help, um, please feel free to contact me and I'll do my best um, to put you in touch with the people uh, who can help move um, your issues, challenges, or inquiries forward. So again, in conclusion for the keynote today, um, thank you very much for being here. We have an amazing day ahead of us dealing with um, looking at some of the fantastic solutions that have been developed in this space, understanding the attributes of these solutions um, and the architectures that will lead towards um, patterns for success. 
Thank you again for being here and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. And please take advantage of the opportunity to interact. If you're not finding the person you want to interact with, contact me and I'll help make the bridge or contact our event team. Thank you again.